Hey everybody, Sean here from the Black Page. Today I'm talking with one of New York's finest drummers, Charlie Zeleny, also known as Charlie Z. Charlie, thanks for being here, man. Hey, Sean, thanks for having me. So, Charlie, let's talk first about Drumageddon. For those of us who've maybe been living under a rock or don't have the internet, uh, what is Drumageddon? Drumageddon was a long, arduous process that I was very, very happy to embark on. It was an idea I've had for a while, you know, to do something totally crazy and different. But what happened was coming through um, a studio of mine, it's like Three Eggs Studios out in Brooklyn. I happened to, you know, go through the studio, and I've been recording there for years and everything, playing a band called Bone Gun out there, a great band, an indie band out there that's um, had me do a ton of stuff. Uh, you know, the studio itself is amazing. So I walked in, and I'm like, i got to do something of my own here. You know, I was thinking maybe a DVD of my own or, you know, checked out the hallways, and it had this really crazy kind of half-life Armageddon kind of a vibe because, you know, the paint from the walls and the whole thing. And then they showed me the roof. And that's when I said, I I've got to do something where I just do the entire building. There's an elevator there. It's, you know, it's a freight elevator that connects everything. And the idea, I'm like, you know what? I got to do a drum solo, a moving drum solo. So that was the very first thing that I did. And see if I could physically do it. That was the first one I did. You know what I mean? And it came out cool. You know, I did the eight minute drum solo of the entire building in one take, you know, as you saw. So. Um, and then I had to one-up myself the next time and, you know, got all the permits and all the crazy logistics together for Drumageddon Manhattan in the center of Times Square. So. <laughs> so suffice to say, being living in a city like New York, um, getting the permits to pull this event off, uh, big hassle or? It was a very difficult thing to do, but it was very cool that we could get in. You know, we had to do it on a tonch and had a big crew, the whole you saw, you know, the crazy thing and everything and uh, another one plan coming up obviously um we're trying to hit all five boroughs before taking other cities so next borough is going to be queens at the world's fair and you know with the big sphere the big globe you know we're going to do a gigantic thing there so that's next too <laughs> uh charlie one of the one of my favorite things about your playing um being that you are a guy who who can i mean when chops are required you have that uh, when you're required to lay it down you have that uh, but one of the things I really like about your playing is you have an ear for melody. You're good at melodic playing. Uh, you do some melodic drumming. How did you get into that aspect of drumming? It's only recently that I got into that style because I'm actually a session guy. You know, I've I've gotten hired for you know more pop and rock records than I can count. Okay. I mean, I think it's 110 records I'm on, and I think I've played like 39 states and 19 and like 19 countries. And you know, I just I play with tons of different people and. That's my gig. You know? So this whole solo thing is a newer thing, and I'm trying to still get the whole band on my little niche. And, you know, that's the thing that I'm doing is this Drumageddon thing, and uh, my solo, which we'll talk about later and the whole thing. But the melodic, I always listened to it growing up and everything. And I did underground prog and metal and, you know, Behold the Octopus, um, Blood Science, played duo with Jordan Moose, you know, things like that which required a very high level skill for, you know, developing the ostinato kind of stuff and crazy polyrhythmic, you know, stuff and everything. So I had the skills already from for so many years. So it's just natural to, okay, I'll just do this with my feet with my hands or I'll be melodic and play this kind right. of a kind of a thing. So, you know. Charlie, you are by far the most endorsed drummer I know. Um, 18 endorsements to date. You represent them very well. Um, okay, a guy like your skill set is it? Should it be obvious that your you know your goal is to be a clinician, or uh, where do you see your career path headed with drumming? The 18 endorsers always want me to do things in that kind of realm. I don't necessarily you know do the whole clinician thing per se. You know I can. I've done it for Jordan. Um, Jordan has his online conservatory where I've done full master classes and core curriculums and clinic material and play-alongs and the whole nine yards. But, you know, I got away from that because I'm working so much in, you know, modern music of, you know, getting hired for... So I wind up going into this and I go, you know what, I can do this, but my thing, I want to try to forge a new path to take, you know, something like Buddy Rich would have done if he lived today sort of a thing. That's what these Drumageddon videos came about and everything. And there's something new, exciting, more performance art based rather than just clinic stuff, you know. I can always do clinics and I, you know, I do them and everything and 
festival appearances of people call and, and all that stuff. But I'm trying to do something a little bit more, um, more, more in the public psyche, if you will, that would resonate a little more with normal people, not just drummers. You know, I could always teach drummers, you know, uh, different courses and everything. And I have a ton of different, you know, I have a gotcha. session drummer book that I, you know, have in the back burner, you know, that I have, you know, um, I have a, a drum special effects course of all crazy weird techniques like one-handed rolls and things like that to, um, that I have in the back burner, but just only so many hours in the day and the hours have been devoted to, you know, getting gigs, touring, you know, recording and then developing, you know, the drum getting, you know, series, and my solo album, all that, so... Charlie, you uh, you had the opportunity to go to Drum Channel, and you of course jammed with uh, Terry Bozio during the drum drum jams. Uh, how cool was that to be interviewed and getting to jam with uh, Terry Bozio? Uh, I had a gig that night, the night before in L.A. at the Knitting Factory, and then I drove my rented a car, drove myself up to Oxnard, where you know the DW factory is. Played that whole thing, had the interview, had a photo shoot jumped back in the car, ran to San Francisco, and gigged that night. Because, yeah. you know, that was the only time I can do it on that one day, which was absolutely insane and absurd. But walking in there, I mean, he the story of which, you know, his son actually introduced me to him. Raynan's actually his son, and he's a great drummer from Austin. You know, he... Uh, Almost actually, incidentally, got the Dillinger Escape Plan gig. You know, he was auditioning and everything. Great player, really cool kid, you know. And uh, he's a really big fan of, you know, some of my older work, you know, the underground prog metal stuff, and introduced me to his, you know, his father, Terry. And Terry was flipping. He hasn't heard music this complex in a long time, and so he wanted to have me out to play. And, you know, I said, oh, do you, are we going to play you with the big kit? And he goes, no, 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 I just want you to have a smaller kit. No, you have the big kit, I'll have a smaller kit, because then I'll be able to feature you instead of having everyone look at my kit. And I was like, all right, cool. And uh, walked in, and there, everyone there, it's a really amazing pro operation. You know, Terry is super cool, very, very laid back. You know, he was helping me. He goes, oh, oh, do you need some help setting that up? You know, the, the hi-hat wasn't in the right place. Oh, I'm, I'm really good at this. Let me let me come over here and move the hi-hat for you. And, yeah, this is Terry Bozio, you know, I grew up, I mean, I have his video right there, I've got the, the old VHS of the Asinato video sitting behind me, you know, and so he was really cool, Don Lombardi there was amazing, you know, the whole team was really pro, and, you know, there were a couple times I had to be like, I'm like a kid in a candy store, but when it got down to drumming, it was real serious business, because we're playing, we're playing, we're playing, and Terry, you know, is amazing, but... Terry can play stuff that, you know, is absolutely inhuman himself. So there was a couple times that I had to be like, hey, man, I'm still here. You know what I mean? Check this. Out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, we're trading. And, you know, just to, to do a yeah. thing. And everything you heard in that was completely improvised. We literally just sat down and just started going. And that was one full hour of tape. And that was just some of the parts and everything. And the interview was the same thing. We just yeah. talked about everything. And that was it. So. Now, one of the things I noticed, Charlie, about the jam itself, um, there was points where both you and, and Terry were sort of shedding and, and wood shedding back and forth and, and playing some really cool stuff. Um, but definitely within your playing, I could see a, kind of a, a definite maturity, um, a guy of your skill set who I think sometimes uh, players who are that that uh, accomplished with uh, their chops uh, can tend to let that sort of get in the way of, of maybe just a, a four on the floor or just a kind of a meat and potatoes type groove thing. Uh, but one thing I do notice about your playing and, and even say when Terry would take a solo was you were you were so easy to just kind of sit back and, and let him have some space and, and lay down a really, really solid groove. Where do you think that maturity comes from in your playing? But I grew up listening to rock music, you know, uh, Pearl Jam and all the uh, you know, Soundgarden and all the, the grunge stuff, you know. Right. There was all sorts of 80s pop, you know, early on. There was So I always had these influences early on, the classical jazz, the uh, pop music, the rock stuff, got into metal, got into, you know, dream theater big time in high school. Um, in college, you know, I put on tons and tons of big productions, which, you know, links back to the Drumageddon production mentality of everything um but 
the main the main scenario of learning how to do that was a very conscious decision very very early on you know and i have to give props to some you know to modern drummer actually was one of the reasons i was in high school i was playing drums and you know a couple friends projects i read about a session drummer and what that was in modern drummer and i said my little 14 year old self said i want to do that I want to be the guy who gets to play everything with anyone all the time and doesn't have to, you know, put up with any of the stuff that a band to put up with. And that's when I started telling my friends in high school, no joke, hey, hey, man, I'm not in your band. I'm just a session guy. I wasn't getting paid at the time, you know, but I was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this and everything. So I was in everyone's band. I was in the talent show and everybody's project. I played with the... uh, the country singer, I played with the dance troupe, I played with the uh, the pop band, I played with the rock band, I played with the, you know, the loud metal thing, I did my own solo, and all this stuff, so it was like I was the hired gun back in high school, and I carried that over many, many years later to doing this, and, you know, I think Steve Gadd was one of the main, you know, everyone knows Steve Gadd as one of the top cool. session guys, but he learned early on that it's not just about the chops. It's not just about that whole thing. It's about groove pocket and making sure you keep on getting hired. All this stuff actually stems from I want to get hired for the next gig, and I want other people to keep on hiring me and everything. The Drumageddon stuff is cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love doing it. I'm going to do it forever, you know, and the same thing with the solo album and the drumistic stuff and that stuff. But my, you know, two and four – is pocket and it puts money in your pocket you know every gig i mean at all the pop gigs i'm playing disco beats nowadays you know a lot of the same you know the uh the upbeat hi-hat stuff you know four on the floor disco beats is you know dance pop music a lot of dance pop you know hires me right now i did a lot of groove stuff i've done latin stuff you got to learn your clave and latin beats and everything um A lot of records, a lot of pop and singer-songwriter records I've done, and those records are just learn how to play brushes, learn how to play, you know, everything needs to be done to a click. That's another thing that's one of my secrets is covering the click. Every single gig that I'm on, I'm on click. Even the Drumageddon videos, that's on click. Yeah, because I had to time everything out exactly to a second. Everything was timed, so I need to hit this mark by this time, this mark by this time, and the same wow. thing. Awesome. Everything is on click no matter what, you know. That's how it has to uh, be, you know, and that's how modern music is. So groove pocket, that's number one. That's how you get hired to, you know, keep on playing. And learning when to lay back, when you let the guitarist solo, yeah. when you let the singer, you know, if they say, hey, be quiet, be softer, you're being quiet yeah. and softer. Charlie, you are, of course, one of the main drummers for Jordan Rudis' projects. Jordan, the uh, keyboard player for Dream Theater. Um, what led to that union, and, and can we expect some more stuff from you guys in the future? When I went to college, I went to this place called Drew University out in Jersey. Um, <clears throat> they didn't have a jazz program at the time. They didn't have a jazz band. They had nothing. So I walked in, and I asked the music department, can you let me create you a jazz program? And they said, hey, you want, oh, that's cool. You want to make a little jazz combo, a little jazz band. That's, that's nice. That's cute. Do it. I said, no, no, jazz program. Like, yeah, yeah, do whatever you want. Are you sure? Because it's going to be crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I got funding through the school, the whole nine yards. There was a jazz orchestra, a jazz big band. There was um, four combos. One was a funk rock combo. Another one was a bop combo. Another one. And a jazz vocal group, um, two jazz vocal groups, and... Each semester, I would put on a big concert, you know, for a ton of kids that came out, um, using all the kids at the school and a couple outside ringers. Um, and every time I would do something different and crazy, you know, one one semester, the last semester, I actually mounted the first five songs of Scenes from Memory with a full live cast, a live band, and a set and stage and staging and the whole thing. And invited i reached out to mike portnoy reached out to jordan you know found their info online they responded back saying they wanted to come and see it and i said this is amazing this is crazy so they didn't wind up coming to see it but i sent them the video afterwards they loved it and we you know got on very quickly and everything oh you're a good musician you're really you know go getter you know you go for things it's awesome and then jordan eventually asked me to hang out at his house a couple times and started to hire me to do different things. I wrote for his magazine. 
I did the online conservatory. I did a bunch of video stuff for him there. You know, I did a whole core curriculum. I did a master class curriculum. I did a bunch of play alongs. I did transcriptions, you know, drum transcriptions. And then out of the blue, he goes, Hey, I need you to be my Rod Morgan scene. He can't do the Japan tour. Do you want to do it? Yes. The answer is yes. I'll do whatever it is. And I only had two weeks, so I had to really buckle down and memorize all that crazy proggy fusion stuff he does, which is cool. insane. And I had to memorize it because, I mean, you can't just go in there and sight read that stuff, you know. But So did that, and uh, I've recorded a bunch of other stuff with him. I mean, he I think he wants me on the next record, which is cool. Um, so whatever, you know, he keeps on hiring me yeah. over the years, but he's so busy with Dream Theater, it's insane. I mean, he's... You know, he is dream theater now that uh, Portnoy is left. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie, for hanging out with us. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Sean. Really, really cool. And Black Page readers, if you enjoyed the video or you want to see more videos or you just want to leave a comment uh, down there somewhere, uh, plus one, comment, tweet, whatever you want to do, um, let us know. Let us know who you are, where you are. If you just want to have your voice heard, that's cool too. www.theblackpage.net. We'll see you real soon.